Good morning. This is the practical session for uh, brain topological data analysis, and it's done by me, Alessandro uh, Crimi, which I'm the uh, research group leader uh, at Sano, and some other some uh, other PhD students, which are Luca Gardini and Joao uh, Falco Roget. Ro 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 <laughs> I will practice later. We thought to just present you some tools that we are just learned. So we're just maybe some step ahead of you and we just share uh, what we learned so far and we in a, in a practical way. More specifically, in the previous lecture, some, uh, introduc some quick brief introduction on other metrics that are mostly more, more popular, more older, that some stuff that, for example, the lecture of uh, Martin van der Hoeffel was about this metric. So we kind of start from there and we build up on a bit more advanced metrics. So, but the context is kind of similar. So we want to try to find some new metrics that can be used for as a biomarker or a further analysis uh, of the brain. So have a quick uh, review. We generally consider different types of connectivity. So one connectivity is the structural connectivity, either from uh, diffusion tensor tractography or from uh, other kind of experiments where you inject uh, adenovirus, where you have some kind of representation with the spaghetti neuron plus some ana an anatomical representation of the brain region, which are like your subdivision, uh, for example, from an atlas and you consider how many tracks are going from one region to another region and you simplify the spaghetti neurons, for example, like with an edge of a graph. So that the, each node individual represents like the centroid of one brain region and the, the stroke of the, of the edge represents how many, um, how many tracks fiber bundles are, are connecting these two regions. Obviously, if it's done with MRI, you know that it's not really the number of axons, it's more an approximation. If you're able to do it with adenovirus or retrovirus, it's, it's more precisely uh, the, the count of the, um, of the axon, of the fiber bundles, but it's definitely more, uh, more invasive. So MRI is generally preferred because it's less invasive. You have to kill the person to do with the adenovirus. Alternatively, the other approach is the, the other approach. The other point of view is to use uh, functional connectivity where we kind of construct again um, this kind of graph made by nodes and edges. So uh, nodes are again the uh, centroid of, uh, of regions, of brain regions, while the, the edges are more representation of uh, uh, temporal correlation, of correlation of these two signals. I don't know if you can see it. For example, in this famous picture from Fox and Gracious, you can see that the the area, the, the PCC, the posterior cingular cortex and the medial, medial frontal cortex, they are represented as the yellow and red, and if you see, they kind of move simultaneously. So they are kind of correlated, while the blue line is like at the opposite, so it's anti-correlated, but it's still there is some kind of correlation, anti-correlation and correlation. And of course, people have been building many variations of the, all these two things, like improvement on how you do tractography or how you use this uh, correlation, temporal correlation, like there is dynamical correlation that you split. So I'm just giving you just a vague idea of how you represent these things. And someone asked the other day, I think it was Professor Kaminska, but these things don't have a harrow. There is the further uh, representation, which is called effective connectivity, where you have arrows. And this means more representation of kind of uh, causality. In fact, it's called effective causality because you have a cause and an effect. So something is happening in some part of the brain that is causing then afterwards, after some time, there is the temporal uh, point of view. There's some other activity in time later on in, the, uh, in another brain region. This thing is more nasty than the previous two in the sense that uh, it's not so trivial to understand this causality, also because sometimes you have uh, independent activity that has nothing to do with moving from one region to another, but sometimes there, there are some movements. There is still an open question, so if you, I, this is a bit of place where you can find new things, but you will find a lot of nightmares, because uh, we still don't agree on what, what is causality, what is 
depending where you talk is accepted, depending whether to talk is not accepted. Historically, there are two major uh, approaches. One is from uh, Carl Freestone. Uh, he, he didn't present it during his talk, but it's, uh, I think I asked him a couple of questions, so it's uh, called dynamical causal modeling. And the other approach is, uh, is uh, uh, Granger causality, which is not strictly something that is mo modeling time, but it's more uh, something related to temporal correlation. In fact, both approaches have been highly criticized that they don't really represent causality. I don't want to open a discussion on this because otherwise we, spoke, we talk uh, months and say in the end you don't believe that causality even exists. But I'm telling you that historically there is a way that you can, in some, with some assumption and restriction, you can say that uh, there is a causality, there is an error in this kind of representation. I, ah, one thing I did some time ago, I want to show you something, was the idea that uh, you can build causality, or maybe it's too fast. For example, if you consider the default mode network, the three regions I showed you before, so that here you see kind of in this not so very visible brain rotated, you have the same region like the media pre uh, prefrontal cortex and the posterior, uh, posterior cingulate cortex and then in the fusiform that kind of represent part of the default mode network. They are functional, but underlying there is a structural connection. So one thing that we thought is that you can have uh, some kind of uh, define this effective connectivity considering putting together structure and functional uh, together with auto regressive model doing some kind of, uh, this is the typical representation of the auto regressive model you have in uh, Granger causality. And I thought that could be, instead of leaving this, I oh, don't see the error, instead of leaving these parameters that is generally optimized, to consider it given as uh, constrained by the structure. This is just one way, but as I was telling you, I don't believe it anymore in this kind of things because it's very hard to prove that this is really causality. It's just an example of how you can get to, now I don't see the arrow, ah, how you can get to this kind of representation with networks in arrows. Another thing is just, uh, for those who don't, don't, don't necessarily work, are come from other domains. So these kind of networks that we use, they're not specific for the brain, so they are also used in other uh, kind of networks. For example, in uh, protein to protein interaction of gene to gene interaction, or some kind of chemistry representation also use this uh, uh, network representation, or also social networks. And in fact, one work that we did was like to combine the two things, like which uh, gene was expressed particularly in some, brain, in some brain region within the connectome, like putting together different, uh, um, dif different types of networks. Now, this is just a brief introduction of the kind of data you can use. So the functional connectivity, structural connectivity, effective connectivity, gene expression, or if you want to put together gene expressions and um, structural connectivity. No, now that you have a vague idea of the kind of data, I will start uh, slowly giving the, the, the words to somebody else to show you how this metric. First, we review the general, most more known um, metrics, and then we move slowly what is topological data analysis. So, what is in the next slide? Oh. And I will start giving the word to Joan. Do we have questions before we start the real stuff? Because this was just the introduction, actually. OK. So um, yes. Um, well, we listened to the talk, right, and, and, and two days ago by Martin. Um, I'm not sure if every one of, of, of you actually uses uh, connectivity metrics, connectomes, and graph measures. Um, if you are interested in doing, uh, we would suggest that the best uh, way to start is um, this article, this famous article in your image, 2010, and the more recent book, which uh, I personally call the Bible of Connectomics, um, which is free. I'm pretty sure you can find it free, but otherwise I can send it to you 
also. Um, because there are many, many, many graphs measures that you can define. And sometimes it's hard to, to remember all. So it's good to have um, like um, some place where you can consultate them. Right? So I, I strongly recommend the, the book if, if you ever need to use it, uh, these quantity graphs. Um, so a network in general, as, uh, as also Martin explained, but to review here quickly, uh, can be of many types. So the first one is an indirect, in undirected graph and also unweighted. Uh, by unweighted we mean that uh, each connection is just is binary, so either is one or zero. And it's like the first type of graph that were introduced. Then you can have directed graphs, which like as, uh, as Alex said already, they are not so easy to obtain because they require some sort of uh, effective connectivity. So they are not strongly used in neuroscience anymore, maybe in the future. Um, and the weighted graph also, each weight uh, represents the strength of connection, uh, whether if it's functional connection, it's the correlations between two brain regions or two voxels. They, they, people have all, has also made uh, voxel-wise brain graphs. And also sliced. The sliced, honestly, we found this picture, but um, I've never, never heard this word before. To me, this is just one graph with two connected components. Um, that there are ways to understand and to know how many connected components there are in a graph. And the last one, also quite tricky, is the uh, temporal evolution of, of brain graphs or, with, or graphs in general. Um, this is interesting in the machine learning perspective to try to predict how these edges uh, will evolve in time. For example, uh, in our case, uh, we have some brain graphs uh, that have a tumor and then you have the surgery and this connection changes. Uh, so you want to infer or predict how this connection is going to change. But this is very tricky uh, in neuroscience. Um, so as I said, also Martin explained a lot of things on, on Tuesday, I think it was. Lots of measures, uh, very beautiful review he did. Um, and you can compute these measures in many, many ways. You can have, you have brain connectivity toolbox that has been around for quite a while. Um, BCTPy, I'm not sure if you're aware of these uh, toolboxes in, in both in Python and MATLAB. BCTPy is the version in Python uh, of the Brain Connected Toolbox. And then there's also a newer one, which I personally prefer, which is called Networks, that we will be using also in the Google Colab or Jupyter Notebook. And also Luis Pessoa showed some, some graphs made with Gephi that also have, have an easy way to compute certain metrics. Um, I'm not really into reviewing all the, all the pairwise uh, interactions uh, that you can have in a network, but each one of them like, tries to describe and characterize the network in a certain way. As I said, both the book and the article in NeuroImage, which I'm very glad to share, um, they have uh, extensions, extensions uh, words on them. Okay, so uh, also Martin kind of hinted this in the, in the end of his talk, right? that uh, network statistics or connectomics, it's not uh, perfect. And I, if you're doing connectomics, I strongly recommend reading this article. Uh, I think it, it's not an easy article to read, also very long. But uh, this picture is really illustrative, right? Because um, all these four graphs in the bottom, they have the same network statistics. So the same clustering coefficient, same number of edges, the same num number of nodes. But they look li really different, right? So using connectomics, you would not be able to, dif to distinguish these graphs. So that's an important shortcoming, right? For example, if you see the second picture on the, on the bottom, right, you, you, see, you find a big hole there. You find a big hole. And if you do topological data analysis, you find this hole, right? So it, in a way, it moves like a, a level further up to distinguish graphs. Also, an important shortcoming of network statistics is that some of them are highly correlated. So you find papers that report this huge number of statistics, right? But they are essentially saying the same thing, just in two different ways. So they are not reporting anything new. Um, so if you are interested in publishing using network statistics, I strongly recommend reading this article, right? Because it, oh, how, how do I, okay. Because it also provides like an, a way, a first way to move forward. Which is something that, it's quite amazing if you think so, especially if you come from either math or engineering, uh, which is doing the Fourier transform of the graph. So if you do the Fourier transform of a graph, 
of a signal, of a temporal signal, you have the harmonics, like in the different ways that a signal vibrates. For example, frequency one, then is added up with frequency two, and then you have a really complicated signal, either in the complex plane or in the real plane. So you do the same thing in a graph, you have your adjacency matrix, and you do, instead of the Fourier decomposition, you do the, the Laplace. So you, 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 you do the uh, Laplace eigen decomposition. And you find the eigen modes, for some of you, maybe this word rings a bell, uh, of the graph. For example, if you see um, this picture there, the first eigen mode of the graph, um, of, the connectom of the connectivity graph, differentiates between the two hemispheres. And this is called um, spectral graph theory, and it's quite famous now. There, um, since 2010, 2019, Neuro Image has published lots of articles uh, with this spectral graph theory, because it allows to have an explanation of how functional activity derives from structural connectivity, right? which is, can be thought of, uh, let's say, the holy grail of neuroscience, at least one of them. Another approach that I personally haven't tested, but I think that it's promising also, is to use uh, information measures, which is graph entropy measures. Like I said, I have not tested that, but if you're also interested, I'm very happy to share this article. And why do I say that? Because not, not long ago, this article was really, really famous, at least in Spain, um, for some reason, some, sometimes uh, nature papers get famous. Um, which they studied the entropy of graphs in cities and they related it to cognitive abilities of people growing in them. So I strongly believe that entropy of graphs has also some information for it. Again, um, so the, there, there's, a, there's a journal right now that it's called Network Statistics. Um, is it like that? Network Neuroscience. Uh, that probably was foundation, this article in Nature was foundational of it. And so it describes in a very beautiful way also all the concepts that we've been saying until now, like multi-layer networks, the dynamics of the edges, and also a little bit of topological data analysis, which if you remember from a preview from a couple of slides ago, you can find the cavity there, something that in connectomics you don't. Okay, so now, now going back um, like to, 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 to topological data analysis, especially in brain networks, um, I will try to sell you why, um, why it, it may be useful to you in your studies. First of all, because it's quite new, so everyone says that if something new, it will get published more easily. Um, and also, we will be following mainly the first two papers on the left. Um, if you find, I think they are both, uh, at least the first one for sure, it's open source. Um, if you have it in front of you, it will probably uh, make the tutorial, the second part, easier because it's like the dictionary of, topo of topological data analysis as it is now. Why do I put also all the other papers and these pictures that right now we cannot understand? Is because it provides results, right? In science, we want results, not just beautiful theories. And if some of you have played with uh, strokes or gliomas in, in rain graphs, it's not always easy to distinguish them uh, from network statistics. And the picture on the, like, on the bottom right um, there's a clear difference between the control and glioma patients. So this is called a phase transition uh, in brain graph. Uh, hopefully, I will make a little um, clear what are they. So maybe they are useful to you also. Okay, this is, um, this is the basis of topological data analysis or higher order networks. I, I hope I, I'm not boring you too much. Um, it's essentially building the same network in different scales. Um, for example, if you want to build a higher order network, or if you want to, uh, to use topological data analysis, it's important to, to understand that the first element of the network is the node. For some reason, they call it differently. They call it zero simplex or one click. And then you have edges between two nodes. Then you have a one simplex or a two click, and then you go on. You start building triangles, right? Um, so if you have some sort of extra, I, this is not difficult, uh, I think there's another one. Yes. Um, and then you can add a fourth node and connect them. That's the important thing, right? Uh, a simplex or a click, uh, a, fo a fourth click, a four click, is four nodes that are connected between all of them. That's important. It's not only four nodes. They have to be connected between all of them. Otherwise, it's not a simplex or it's not a click. And the network, it's built of, this, um, of these pieces, 
right? And each layer, each order of the network, it's the number of four clicks, the number of five clicks, the number of seven clicks, right? So why do I say this? This is quite obvious and quite useless, right? As, as it is now. But all the topological data analysis metrics that we've defined are based on the number of each one of these clicks, right? And also, one thing that I forgot to mention, with Martin, someone mentioned some, uh, the thresholding of functional connectivity matrix, right? That the results change a lot depending on the threshold. If you do topological data analysis, there's a process called filtration that what essentially says is that all thresholds are important to characterize the network. So that may be also an answer to your question. I, I, I sorry, I don't remember who asked it. Um, if you have any questions, also stop me, because I think that if this is the first time you see it, it's quite um, weird. Um, OK, so like you start by creating your nodes, whatever in positions in space, and then you have your zero simplex, or one clicks. It's like, like shifted. Then you start connecting them, and you add two clicks, or one simplexes. And then you start doing the same thing, right? And you end up with, uh, in this case, we would need to count it. But for example, the the, there are three, tri three triangles, right? So that makes it, uh, no, how many triangles? Well, a lot of them. But the, the, the signal are three, right? Three clicks or, four, or two simplexes. Two simplices. And the one on the, on the, on the top uh, bottom right, it's a fives, right? Because all of them are connected. So as, long, uh, yeah, as you go higher in dimension, it's not so easy anymore to distinguish them. Uh, yeah. Right, so this is also important that in some places you will find the word simplices and in some places you will find the word clicks. They are essentially the same thing, but just shifted with one. A zero click is a one simplex, a one click is a two simplex, and, go on, and, and so on and so on and so on. Um, like you can train, you can try to understand how many three clicks there are. For example, in the, in the pictures of the right, there are only three clicks. And you, you will find 17 and 18 number of triangles. So that's like a training step to, 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 to start visualizing these higher order networks. This is a study. Um, it's, again, also to show that uh, topological data analysis provides results. It's not just a funny way of doing statistics. Uh, you can find this one. Um, what essentially was saying is that you, you, you find topological differences between different types of networks. Um, di yeah, different types of networks. Uh, not only like large networks you can find, uh, or the default mode network, or, or, or connections, uh, different topological connections between brain regions. Okay, now we move into topology itself. Uh, which I, I will try not to, not to go too long with this because it's a quite abstract field of mathematics. But you need to, it's, so topology in brain graphs is, is extremely abstract and complex and it helps uh, to go back into the world of 3D and 2D that we are more used to. The main math quantity in topology is what is called the Euler characteristic, which is a way to define um, surfaces that are identical. For example, all the, sur all the surfaces in the right are topologically identical, even if they are different to our eyes, because they have the same Euler characteristic. It's not that important how we compute this Euler characteristic, because we use Python libraries. But uh, it's important to understand that two graphs or surfaces that have the same Euler characteristic, or Euler for, for, for the Netherlands people, um, differentiate between different types of surfaces and graphs. Right? Uh, there's a famous joke in physics that uh, all cows are spherical. Well, if you think in topological terms, this is, tr this is true. Because a sphere and the cow have the same number of holes. Holes is also an interesting concept in topology. Right? And also this one. You have a cup of coffee, which is very different from a donut, but essentially they have the same number of holes. So they are topologically equivalent. Right? So you may, you may be wondering, why am I saying this? What, where are the graphs? So you have to make the abstraction that what happens in surfaces is the same as it happens in, gra in graphs. Two graphs that have the same Euler characteristic, they, have the, the same, they are topologically equivalent. There's a definition for that that I don't remember, and it's not really important. But in terms of topology, they are identical. So 
we, we would like to find differences in topologies of the graphs. That's why we use it. OK, another important thing that it's actually related uh, with, the, with the Euler characteristic and topology is the Betty numbers. This is a very tricky concept, and it's related to topological holes. Right? A topological hole you can imagine, for example, a sphere has zero holes. Um, because if you draw a line, uh, a straight line, like a circle or, or deformed circle, and then you shrink it, you can actually concentrate it in one point. So there's no hole in that. However, what happens with a torus or a donut? You can do the same thing, and actually it also gets concentrated in the same point. Right? But what happens if you do this line, and you try to shrink it? You will never be able to do it, right? I'm not sure if you can imagine the picture, but it will, it will never shrink to one point. So that makes it a hole. And you can also define this line that cannot be shrinked. It just can wander around the, the, the torus. So the number of holes are also relevant um, for, for topology. And there is like, uh, they are characterized by, the, by these Betty numbers, which again are not easy to compute, but it's a Python function. So no one's going to ask you to compute the Betty numbers in the exam. Because <laughs> I don't know how to do it, actually. <laughs> um, what is that? Okay, there's a mistake here. So anyway, the idea is that you do the same thing with graphs. This is not easy to understand, and it's not easy to visualize. But the Betty, the, the be so each Betty number is characterized with a subindex. And for example, the first one, the, 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 the only one that we can actually visualize is the beta zero, which is the number of connected components. So in this case, there are four, four, uh, four components in that graph. So if the Betty number in this case would be four. The first Betty number is the number of, uh, let's say, well, they say one-dimensional holes, but it's also not easy to visualize. But what I do is like, I try to imagine the same example as in the, as in the torus. Like you have to draw a line and you try to shrink it into a point. So in the left case, you actually can't do it. You're stuck in the, in the square. But in the, in the, um, in the right case, you can, actually connect, you can actually connect all the dots to one point, right? And you go up and up and up and up and up in the dimensions, and it gets inc insanely more complex. Like, I don't understand the third Betty number. And the second one, you can also imagine, like, there's a cavity, like it was in the torus, but it's not really necessary. It's just the connection between topology and, 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 and graphs. Now, this is the important part, actually. Not, all, not, not, <laughs> not, not all, the, all the concepts before. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of filtration in break graphs. I'm not sure if anyone knows this. Um, what you do, actually, when you build a functional connectivity matrix, you usually, you usually threshold. Let's say at, oh, at uh, correlation uh, slower, smaller than 0.1, they are simply kept to 0. And the other ones are kept to 1, or they are kept weighted. But what happens if you actually measure all the thresholds possible. So you measure all the networks that emerge from filtrating at a different uh, Pearson correlation. What do you get is actually, for, ex for example, on the left side, you start with zero and you essentially get the nodes only. And then you start filtrating and you get different networks. So what happens, for example, to the first Betty number in this case? Remember that the first Betty number is the number of connected components. Right? So when the, the filtration value is either 0 or 1, depending on how you define it, you start with the, the total number of nodes of the network. And then you start connecting it, and you end up with 1, usually, if the network is healthy. Meaning that there is only one graph connected to each other, right? which is usually what happens in healthy networks. But maybe, in some cases, I found that in tumors, you can actually have two or three components. So the network is disconnected, right? You can also find this with spectral graph theory, but it's rather limited. And the idea is that you analyze the topology of each one of these networks. And you can, can define um, really interesting findings. Uh, well, hopefully I will convince they are interesting. OK, also, as long as you increase the filtration value, you increase the number of one clicks, two clicks, three clicks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Until the network is fully connected, and you probably define an end click, right? When the whole network is connected, you have defined an end click, an end being the, the total number of nodes. 
Uh, I think that the collab has this picture, so, so, so you will be able to, 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 to visualize it also yourself. Another important point is that as long as you increase the, um, the filtration value, you also change, like I said, the topological properties. So the Betty numbers decrease, the Betty zero, the, the zero Betty number decreases. But at some point, adding connections creates clicks and also creates holes. For example, in the third row, in third column, you have created a click, uh, a, one, uh, a one hole, like remember the square. So that's, all, that's important because in this case, something has changed in the network and different networks change at different filtration values. That's what people have found, right? And it's the most promising area of research uh, in, in topological data analysis right now because otherwise it's fairly similar to, to, to connectomics. In this case, it's the same. Like uh, as long as you increase the filtration value, you decrease the number of connected components and you increase the number of higher dimensional uh, structures, either clicks or, let's say, holes. Okay, I should be close to the end, yes. Um, this is a, also an interesting result. Uh, it's more simple than the one I will present later, but it's still interesting. In a way that they did this filtration process um, between different parcellations, so AAL, it's one parcellation of the human brain and the other three are also the parcellations and what they found, for, forget about the black line, it's not really important what they found is that patients with attention deficit like the, Betty, the first Betty number decreases higher, uh, decreases more rapidly meaning that the network gets connected more, uh, sorry, the other way around, so in healthy patients then as long as you increase the filtration value, the network gets connected more easily. So there are more connections, right? The connections are not that sparse. And it's the opposite in attention deficits. So that's an interesting result that proves that topological data analysis also gives meaningful results besides giving funny pictures. And this one, I recommend this paper actually if you're interested in doing topological data analysis because it's quite seminal. And it relates um, what is called the Euler characteristic um, as a function of the filtration value and the Betty numbers. So remember that the Betty numbers can be thought of a higher dimensional structure, so as the complexity of the graph per se. And um, as, as long as you increase, as, as, as you increase the filtration value, what happens in, for example, if you look at the, well, the, the top picture, what happens is that at some point, a change occur, occurs in the network. So a new complexity layer has been added. And what happens is that the hour characteristic diverges, goes to zero, so the logarithm diverges, right? And if you do this filtration process between, in this case, glioma functional networks and healthy networks, um, you find a difference, a difference that cannot be found if you use connectomics. For example, in my case, I've looked at many, many different network measures in glioma, uh, meningioma, and controls, and there is essentially nothing different, nothing different, right? So this gives a new perspective. That's why we are trying to use it. We are trying to use it also dif to differentiate different types of diseases. Um, yeah, so this is called the phase transition. It, it's a name uh, borrowed from physics, but uh, because this is, can be thought also as the entropy of the network, the Euler entropy of the network, and that's why they call it a phase transition. But that's not really important. What is important or cool is the, 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 the picture on the, on the middle, right? Because if you see the, the, um, the pink line, it's the, the curve that tracks phase transitions. And you see the Betty numbers. So the first transition, the first phase, let's say, is the first uh, Betty number, so the zero, the, the beta zero which tracks the, connect, the connected components of the graph. So this is important, right? And at some point, this changes. So the, the graph get, gets connected, and the number of um, higher dimensional, of, of one-dimensional holes, let's say, that are usually related with one clicks, usually, not always, gets higher. And then you start building connections once again, and, the, and this decreases because you cannot create more triangles, right? At some point, you cannot create more triangles. And then you start creating weird structures, and then the second Betty number goes up. And this is in all the phase transitions. So as long as you increase filtration, 
the filtration value, the complexity of the network increases. And this can, also, can only be tracked with topological data analysis. And one last thing um, is the curvature. You can also define the curvature of a graph, right? So a pizza is flat, uh, unless you have a calzone. And the curvature of the pizza remains the same. Even if, you, even if you modify the pizza to eat it in a fancy way, it still has to be the same number, right? So the same happens with graphs. You can define the curvature of a graph. Related also with surfaces. surfaces. Um, so I just put the formula there to, under, to, to, to prove you that the formulas are not easy, but you just use the Python packages that, that these people uh, have built. The curvature of a node, you can actually find the curvature of a node, relates to as how many clicks is that node involved in. Right? So you can, you can sort of imagine that if a node is really, really, really connected, the graph will be pushed towards that node, and the curvature will be positive or negative. So as you increase the filtration value, clicks get added, clicks or, or, or simplices get added, and the curvature also changes, tracking these additions in the network. So that's another topological measure that, you can, that, you can, that these people have looked at. And I think this is the last slide. Yes, I just wanted to say that um, if you're really, really, really into uh, theory, uh, what they say is that um, these measures, these topological measures, can actually be defined in many, many, many different ways. And the only requisite is that they have to be what is called topologically invariant. And you have to imagine for that that the cow is the same as the sphere. So if you come up with some cool with some cool uh, math definition that is the same in a sphere and a, and, a, and a cow, it's like a new measure. Like in the way they started with clustering coefficient and then they built global efficiency and so on and so on and so on. Um, so it's an active field of, of research, I would say. Either promising or not, it, uh, it, we will have to see, I guess. But so far, uh, it's been quite useful to us. Um, so if you're doing connectomics, I would definitely recommend at least taking a look. Um, yeah, Lucas, so thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't bother, um, bore you too much. I'm just quite passionate about topology, although it, I, 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 I admit that it's quite useless also. Um, <laughs> it is, it is. I mean, no one really cares how many holes has a donut. Um, so Luca will be carrying on with the, um, with the tutorial. I suggest you try to load the Google call app instead of the, just the Jupyter notebook, but uh, it should work in both cases. We've tried it. I also will be like around here because I also want to see some pictures that I haven't. And if you are interested in talking about topology or discussing, like I will be here also. And to, well, yeah, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's it for my part. And Luca will take on from here, yes. Okay. Before, before we go into the practical part, do um, we have questions? Or? Yeah. You know already all the things? Okay, great.